My cherry blossom beauties, thank you so much for joining me today and welcome to the show. I'm as gay as a daisy today because it's a gorgeous day here in England. Really beautiful. It's fresh, kind of cold and a bit blowy, but with some glorious sunshine. Just taking the edge off of it, which is just how I like it. Can't stand the summer, high summer and any temperatures that make you perspire. It's just not for me at all. But this time of the year when the season's on the turn one way or the other is really nice. And it's clement when it, for filming as well. I don't get too uh, flustered and florid. So that's all good. And I call you my cherry blossoms. I think in my last video it was, I said, hello, my pear-shaped popsicles. And uh, yeah, I just call you that because I, I refer to you as my fruit, my dear old fruit. So uh, you may know that I have a, a, a love for anything fruit related, be it in poetry, art, this kind of thing, even a few vegetables here and there. But I think my, my pear painting up there is my the favorite, my most favorite painting that, that I possess. It's a bit obscured today. I will hang it one day. It's just that I've been waiting till I decide what I'm going to do with the walls. Once I've done something with the walls, then I'll hang the painting. But uh, yes, I said I used the expression pear shaped. And some of you thought uh, you took it in good humor, but you thought I was referring to your body shapes. Say, How did you know, River? How did you know that I'm pear shaped? Well, actually, in England, and I think through some other parts of the Anglosphere, pear-shaped is actually a saying, it's usually said in a sort of Cockney accent, to be honest. Things have gone a bit pear-shaped, love. Things have gone a bit pear-shaped. I'm not sure where else it's used in the world. But uh, it is used to mean things have gone a little awry. You know, things have gone a little bit obtuse. Here we are, my dear. But usually it's out when you're raving, darling, with the wide boys from Essex and so-and-so. They say, it's all gone pear-shaped, darling. It's all gone pear-shaped. It's all the air. And uh, yeah, I looked into it because you mentioned it in the comments. No one's really sure where it came from, but it came into popularity, they say, in the 1940s, but it was actually through an American influence, Mae West. Uh, she was in a movie, what was it called? Chickadee, My Little Chickadee in the 1940s with W.C. Fields. And she said, I have, or one of them said, I have some very definite pear-shaped ideas. And it seems that it was picked up post-war in Britain by some people here, probably gays to be honest, because more gays watched Mae West than, than straight men, I should imagine. Uh, she had that kind of effect, it's usually, isn't it? It's the gays and the girls that get in there first with these sayings and expressions. So, uh, yes, she used it. And then some of trainees from the Royal Air Force, they were making preparations for World War II with doing their loop the loops. But some of the more inexperienced pilots, they weren't making a perfect circle. They were sort of going, mm, sort of bottoming, bottoming out so to speak, in a sort of pear shape. So that could be where it came from. Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher apparently used the expression in her conversations with Ronald Reagan. And <laughs> I don't know if that's true. That's what's been reported. The press didn't have a clue what she was going on about. It's all gone pear shaped. And uh, also it could have come from the potter's wheel. Overly fast turning on a potter's wheel could distort the shape of a circular bowl or vase into a pear shape and of course glass blowers as well all kinds of rumors dear but nothing definitive so there's your little trivia for today <laughs> well isn't this interesting harry and megan have announced that archwell audio are ready at last they're ready to provide us with their spotifications that were announced what was it 18 months two years ago they're finally happy with spotify and have agreed to go ahead and make content for them and of course, as many of us guess, it's going to drop in the summer. Sandwiched as it appears, it's going to be between the Platinum Jubilee, so they can ride on the crest of that wave. And then, of course, with the memoir coming up. So it's wonderful publicity for that. As I've said before, it looks like everything is going to be rolled out uh, from this late spring, summer onwards in support of the memoir to get those bums on seats, you see. But as we all know, Harry and Meghan are perfectly articulate, but they are not hypnotic, are they? They're not magnetic as an attraction. And, well, I'm just going to say it, they're boring. They are so dull and really pretentious. So 
No one is interested what they've got to say. You see, this is the thing, but there are some talented producers out there who have obviously been hired by Archwell Audio and they will be using the kind of tricks, in my opinion, that they used on the first podcast, which is to hire other names. They need to surround Harry and Meghan with a frame of confusion. So there'll be some big names, I'm sure, dropping in to attract attention because I'm sure episode one might pull in a few curious viewers here, there and everywhere. Uh, but if it's just Harry and Meghan alone, no one's going to tune in again because no one cares about the kind of things they're going to be talking about. You know, when I say no, what I'm talking about when not hundreds of thousands, which is what they need or millions. You know, uh, so they're going to either have to bring in big names or, as I believe, uh, be discussing rather controversial issues that might arise from Harry's memoir. We'll see. But the statements they come out with, I talk about pretentious, my dear, makes my teeth itch. It really does. And as one of my dear viewers told me the other day, you can put sugar on shit, but it doesn't make it a brownie. And you're so right in the case of Harry and Meghan and, and their outpourings. They're not talented in that respect. They have talents of different kinds. They both have talents of different kinds, but not for entertainment. As we continue to tackle the misinformation era. <laughs> oh. Oh. Truth is stranger than fiction, isn't it, my dears? These people talking about misinformation. Piers Morgan had something to say about that as well, which we'll come to. Uh, as we continue to tackle the mis misinformation era, Archwell Audio has found it important to work with our partners at Spotify to ensure that the digital technologies so many of us use every day are rooted in strong principles of trust and safety. We're encouraged by ongoing conversations we've had with Spotify on this shared goal. And we've been working closely with their team as well as their senior leadership towards policies. This is where it gets sinister. Policies, practices and strategies meant to raise creator awareness, minimize the spread of misinformation or information you don't like, and support transparency. Ooh, it's chilling, isn't it? Quite chilling. As we move forward at Archwell Audio, we too are eager to be responsible stewards of an audio landscape. Oh, that's the most pretentious bit. Stewards of an audio landscape. Oh that is well resourced with quality fact-based information, particularly when it comes to public health. And it is sinister because yeah, there is no harm in addressing misinformation, but as we've seen, those of us from all stripes and in the national media, they've been called out for misinformation and whether or not various journals and papers have been uh, sued by them for insinuating that they might've lied or fabricated or exaggerated whether or not the court of public opinion is always going to be divided on that one who won't be silenced is Piers Morgan who says Princess Pinocchio lecturing people on misinformation beyond parody so a proven liar is now satisfied that nobody else is lying <laughs> beyond parody there's been some whispers in the press that Harry and Meghan were invited late last year to present an Academy Award, an Oscar, at the ceremony coming up later this month. And the Oscars is on, on the 27th of March. Prince Philip's memorial, which they are said to be missing, well, I think they've confirmed they're missing, is on the 29th. So people have said, is that why they're, they're not going? Because they're going to be attending the Oscars instead? Although there is a two-day gap between, so who really knows? I mean, I've got to tell you, I'm delighted that they're not going to Prince Philip's memorial. I think Harry already entirely disgraced and besmirched his grandfather's memory in his grandfather's dying days by his behaviour, which Prince Philip told Giles Brandreth, his good friend. Mr Brandreth has confirmed this, that he was upset about the whole thing and said that it's, be, it's turning the entire family into a soap opera. So he's already made that disgrace of his father's me grandfather's memories, as far as I'm concerned. I don't need him to be turning up. To memorial services. He can remember him from the Casa, can't he? He can remember him there, if he dare. But apparently they were being lined up to present Best Actress in a nod to mark their work on women's rights. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, the plan was apparently scrapped after Kristen Stewart was nominated for her work in Spencer playing Diana's mother. A few people asked me to review that movie. I didn't watch it. I didn't go to see it because I saw the trailer and I knew it wouldn't be my cup of tea. I, I, I appreciate it got very good reviews. Apparently it's more of a fantasy rather than anything that's supposed to be too realistic. It's sort of high octane operatic. And I quite like, I quite like it when uh, biographical films do that, when they allow themselves to play and be artistic and give an artistic impression. It's probably better doing that than trying to give a dry, honest rendition of Diana. I think it's better to try and do it in fantasy, but I just knew that I wasn't going to take much out of the film and the, the performance, however it good, would, would have annoyed me. But the Oscar ceremony, I think for most of us, is a bit of a joke now, isn't it, these days, my dear? No one trusts award ceremonies. We all know, and we're more privy to know now the sort of politics behind all of these things and all the movers and shakers behind the scenes uh, you know no one really trusts that the greatest talents in front of us are going to be recognized just those with the best connections perhaps they're very much produced and proliferated by the sort of wokey elite aren't they and of course I'm generalizing here that tends to be the way it goes now this really gave me a lift the other day because she is such a favorite of mine and such a gorgeous woman and I was really delighted that her work was recognised by Her Majesty. This was a few days ago, I think it was Wednesday, uh, at Windsor Castle in the Oak Room. It was an award that was established in 1933, and it's given out to citizens of the United Kingdom or the Commonwealth, and it's the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. And I was so thrilled that it went to Grace Nichols. And if you don't know her poetry, I would strongly urge you to do some Googling of some and even to purchase some. I've got one of her volumes and uh, it is so gorgeous. And what I love about it, well, you know that I love fruit. I have a thing for, although I don't eat that much fruit these days because I'm trying to cut down on sugar, but I do like fruit. And she makes lots of poetry. She includes a lot of references to fruit, cherries, mangoes, coconut, lots of gourmand and fruity references uh, throughout and so it has a particular, and strawberries as well. Uh, so I, I find it delicious to read. My opera gloves keep slipping down. <laughs> I'm sure I'll get some comments on that. Stop showing your elbows, River. Yeah, they're a little bit slippery on me, but uh, <laughs> rather enjoying the opera gloves today, my dear. A bit slinky, aren't they? But Grace Nichols exemplifies the best of our friends from the Commonwealth who came to share their treasures and their beauty with us on our fair shores. She was born in 1950, but she traveled over here to the kingdom in 1977. And her work brings not just elegance, but humor. It brings elegance and humor to an understanding of a woman's life who is an immigrant to this country and is trying to make sense of the world. And I find her work extremely uplifting because like so many of our friends and lovers who have traveled to the United Kingdom from Commonwealth countries, they have a particular journey that they go on and oftentimes the arts be it painting poetry visual arts or the word whatever it is you know they can often bring such an elegant understanding to those sort of caribbean british connections because she's from the west indies um, it makes sense of them in a way that just general chit chat can't but she was most gracious about the Queen and about the honour. She said, uh, she described the honour as both wonderful and humbling. Very gracious woman. She said to poetry and to the English language I love. I've brought the registers of my own Caribbean tongue. I wish my parents who used to chide me for straining my eyes as a small girl were around to share in this journey that poetry has blessed me with. And you can see the Queen there looking divine in a sort of creamy looking dress with the pearl earrings. Glorious. And what I particularly enjoyed in that photograph was the fact that Her Majesty was shown at a flattering angle. Because of late, almost every photograph I've seen of her, or video footage, gets her in profile. And no, there's no shame in developing a poorer posture, or I hesitate to use the word, but a slight little bend or hump should we say absolutely no shame whatsoever so don't start getting your knickerbockers in a twist ears but 
I'm sure Her Majesty herself would agree that it is nice to be, uh, you know, angles, dear. It's all about the angles, isn't it? So uh, it was nice to get a rather softer angle, should we say, from the photographer there. And I think they should bear that in mind uh, with all photographs. Uh, a few of you have, uh, I don't like to discuss the delicate subject of Her Majesty's health. She's chosen to draw a veil over certain subjects, so we won't go into it too much. A few of you have called it a dowager's hump. Uh, Angus Ross says, uh, osteoporosis. She has developed a dowager's hump, probably in a lot of pain. A few of you have suggested that. When I hate the thought of Her Majesty being in pain, that's the one thing I can't bear. People that I care about being in pain. There's nothing worse, isn't it? It's worse than your own pain when you know that a beloved, be it child or, or elderly relatives in pain, it's just the worst feeling and one that's hard to shake. Lady Sapphire, I've often wondered if the Queen suffers from osteoporosis. My mother had it and I have it too. It's in my spine so I can fully understand the pain people suffer. I'm sorry, Lady Sapphire. I do wish you very well. Uh, one thing I love about the Queen's look is that shock of white hair. Isn't it pure, brilliant white? She's very lucky that it hasn't gone, you know, sort of ra rather dirty, dishwater grey. But uh, she has that shock. It's like Karl Lagerfeld or something, isn't it? So a lot of people pay good money for that uh, to be as a sort of dye job. It can be achieved, but I believe with Her Majesty, it's entirely natural, and it gives an air of the chic, doesn't it, about Her Majesty? Actually, she reminded me of Karl Lagerfeld that time she showed up and completely upstaged everybody, including Anna Wintour at uh, London Fashion Week that time in her gloves that I'm channeling today. She looked so fashion forward and completely edgy. And she just looked like the most fabulous thing in that crowd. I lived for that moment, absolutely lived for it. And another fashion moment regarding the Queen that I was curious about, because I mentioned the other day, I mentioned Camilla's boots, I thought were rather foxy. And I said, oh, you don't see the Queen in those. Uh, but of course I was proved wrong. And I did a bit of a Google search and there are seldom, it seems seldom that she ever wears boots. There's very few photographs of her in anything other than wellies, uh, you know, sporting accessories, things like that. Very few that I could find with her in boots. But I'll, sh I'll share a few with you now, just because they are quite rare. We had the one here of her in red with the smart black boots, quite perfunctory, nice. Uh, always looks regal. Uh, blue, she's in here with the tight-fitting high-heeled boots. And uh, quite kinky, you know, kinky boots, kinky boots. Old, uh, old uh, pushy pushy galore on a black one and uh, Patrick McNee. Uh, yes, kinky, 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 kinky boots, slinky, slinky. 60s white boots, yes, that was one that I was quite shocked by and taken it back. I wasn't sure if the photograph was engineered or photoshopped in some way, but it seems to be genuine. Uh, there she is looking very 60s, getting into the spirit there. Very racy, my dear. Might have had a few old tipples with Margaret Rose. And even in leopard skin. Uh, not so much with knee boots there, but a sort of booty affair. Can't really see what they are, but some kind of booties. And then we have another one, blue there. Now, I don't like that hat. Quite, I find it quite ugly. But yes, Queen in Boots. We spoke about Ireland a couple of days ago, St. Patrick's Day, everybody dressing up in green. Uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't dress up in green. A few pe people mentioned that. A, I didn't have any green stuff around. But B, I've never dressed up for St. Patrick's Day or celebrated it. Nothing against Ireland, it's just not really my bag. But I'm wearing a little splash of green here today with this gorgeous brooch. Yeah, that's like my little sprig of shamrock for you, I guess, although these are some Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, Lee, Lee Murray, Ireland's official colour is blue. And yes, you're right, my dear. Well, you're right, but you're wrong. I mean, I tried to do a bit of research when this came through, but apparently there is no official colour of Ireland, but I, I might be wrong there. As far as I know, there's no official colour, but yes, St. Patrick was first represented by the colour blue and all the imagery from the 13th century that went on with Patrick in his robes, they were blue, they were depicted as blue. So who knew? I'm sure many of you did, but lots of people just assume that it's all green, 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 green. But green didn't become the symbol of Irish nationalism until 1789. And that was when a series of rebellions took place against the kingdom 
and there was more of a growing desire for, for Irish republicanism, which of course they achieved that aim in the end. Uh, and it was seen to be an important distinction to start using green to differentiate between Ireland and Scotland, because Scotland of course has blue in their flag. So yeah, it depends who you talk to. Blue can certainly be associated with Ireland, and certainly was going back in history, and it's still used a hell of a lot there. Uh, but yes, I think as Ireland became to be associated much more as the Emerald Isle, which is great for its publicity drive and its branding, isn't it? The Emerald Isle sounds glorious. Uh, but it became known for that lush greenness and leprechauns, darling, at the end of the rainbow. You all a fan of Finian's rainbow? I remember that that movie that came out, and I can't really do an Irish accent either in my ears because it wanders about from region to region. But um, Finian's Rainbow, was it Petula Clark with Fred Astaire? I can't, I can't remember, but. Lovely little movie there with the leprechauns gambling about at the end of a rainbow. Look, searching for their pot of gold. Yes, I know it's an awful Irish accent, but I'm having fun. Uh, ah, my furs! <coughs> The furs! The furs! Even my furs springing back to life, dear, and scurrying away because my attempt at an Irish accent was so dreadful. But as for Northern Ireland, I believe that they don't have their own official flag other than the Union flag because they're sharing it with us here in the United Kingdom. So that's for them. But, the re but Ireland itself, the Republic of Ireland, their flag, uh, the, the Tricolor, tricolor flag is uh, which order does it go? Orange, white, green, green, white, orange. Green represents the Catholic side. Orange represents the Protestant side, and white represents peace between the two in the middle. And no offense to Irish people watching, because I Ireland is beautiful and I, I love Ireland, etc., etc. Caveat, caveat, caveat. But I don't find that flag at all aesthetically pleasing. I don't like the palette. The, the orange and the green and white together. So I kind of wish they'd chosen another colour other than the orange, because green and white would be lovely if it was all green to represent the Emerald Isle and then just have a splash of white to represent the piece. Uh, but then, no, that wouldn't work, because then it would only represent uh, the Catholic side of things. So it's a bit of a shame, but mm, I don't like the colours, dear. They've got to go. Someone needs to redesign that flag. Please! Okay, let's have a quick old cosy old chinwag Madeira's in Tip Jar Corner. Well, I was really pleased yesterday. Was it yesterday I picked this up or the day before? Really pleased I nipped out and found this gorgeous Bolero top. I absolutely love it. Isn't it perfect? And it fits me so perfect. Because, you know, I often wear ladies wear on here and I often pick it up from the charity shops. And, um, you know, it, it is hard to find a particularly good fit. I'm tall uh, and, you know, taller than most ladies and longer limbs and this, that and the fourth. So it can be a bit of a struggle. And the men's stuff's just so boring. So, so boring. Uh, another grey jacket. So it was, I was so pleased to find this. Uh, it was six ninety nine, so not cheap as chips. But I'll, I'll use this a few times before redonating it back to the charity shop. Uh, I managed to get two new brooches, including this one, which is gorgeous. I made a wonderful friend at the Vintage Fair, because I go there quite often, so they got to know me. Secondhand Susie, and she's wonderful at putting aside things for me. She knows that in particular, brooches and necklaces, and I want large, large ones, bright ones, uh, necklaces, and uh, not so much with the rings, and I don't wear the earrings anymore. I don't think they play very well or sing that well. So maybe on special occasions I'll put my earrings on for you dears. But uh, mainly stuff around here I think is nice for giving, offering a bit of bling. But yeah, secondhand Susie, Susie she's wonderful and she pulled out this lovely one of uh, the two Egyptian, I, I think they're pharaohs. And I love the green and black together. And of course it's on the royal theme, very royal. And this one too, I don't think I've shown you this one. I think so. It is a, uh, what is it? A lion surrounded by some beautiful stones there with the crown above. So again, a very royal theme with the crown or coronet. Uh, an emerald, a lovely watery pink gem, like a little sugar ice bun and a pale topaz with a royal blue sapphire, ruby, uh, pillar box red uh, and a yellow uh, citrine. 
and a lovely uh, smoky aquamarine there. <laughs> I'm sure my my diagnosis there wasn't accurate, but I just love the words. The words of colours, the words of gemstones. Oh yes, my dears. I just love it. So yeah, a few more glitzy witsies. Oh, and also, <laughs> I don't know why I picked this up. So hideous, it's going to go straight back, but it was only £1.49. It's sort of concealed a bit over there. There's a plate. Oh, my, my sugar rice buns are popping up. I'm, wearing, I'm actually wearing a corset for you today, my dear. I've got my lingerie on. Peekaboo, peekaboo. Oh, oh, it looks like, it looks like alien hands, doesn't it? Coming <laughs> up to throttle me. <gasps> These opera gloves, the black velvet opera gloves are lovely. They do slip down here and there occasionally, but they're wonderful. And I bought another pair, not secondhand, new and not that cheap. Uh, that I will share with you in, at the right moment in a future video. And they are really special, really divine. They're completely nude uh, gloves, sort of transparent, but encrusted with sparkles and with some glorious sparkly nails. But I'll save that reveal for future when I'm feeling particularly dramatic or particularly princessy and royal. So you can wait on that one, can't we, my dears? Oh yeah, I was going to talk about the plate. Hideous, hideous plate. I just picked it up because I was in the charity shop and I just bought this and I thought, oh, I could do with something else gold to put in the background, you know, black and gold. Let's go with the theme. And that was there and it was 149. I, I knew that I hated it. I don't know why I did it, but you know, who cares? The money went to charity and it'll go back to charity. So uh, one reason I hate it is because there's birds on it. I love cute little birds. I love little bluebirds, uh, which always makes you think of my friend Sarah. I know you're watching Sarah, dear. And no, that doesn't mean to do what you're not allowed to do anymore. That's between me and you, but don't do that. Uh, but I'm just saying hello to you. Bluebirds, um, little chicks, you know, any, robins, you know, anything like that is sweet. Anything that bounces about. Uh, like a little bobbin on the floor. Wonderful. But anything with like large beaks, large legs. I mean, I think they're wonderfully fascinating and I can watch them for hours sometimes, but they remind me too much of reptiles and dinosaurs. And um, I don't know, I see some kind of evil in their eyes. And I've had bad experiences with birds and the noise they make, particularly herring gulls in the past. When I had to spend some time living on the coast, they made my life an absolute misery. Uh, evil things they were, evil. I love seagulls, I love the sound of seagulls. Well try living next to 50 of them scavenging through litter bins on heat and protecting their eggs my dear and you will find out exactly how loud they are, how huge they are and how utterly terrifying they are my dear. Terrifying! So yeah that plate's going back. But talking about birds, ooh this should go in my moments of indulgence section, but I'll, I'll share it with you today. My old, my handbag. What's in my handbag? Don't they do those on YouTube? Uh, my handbag, and I feel a bit guilty because I didn't preserve the box properly. I ripped it open as soon as I got home. And actually, I'm not recommending this because it's too sweet. I've got a sweet tooth, as you know. Well, I've got a, a tooth. I've got teeth for sweet and savoury. I love them equally, really. But I don't like really, really, really sweet things. And this, I'm afraid, is a really, really, really sweet thing. Uh, but it's good quality. It's uh, Heston from Waitrose, Heston Blumenthal's range of four ex extraordinary chocolate hen's eggs with an indulgent banoffee centre. Banoffee is banana and toffee. So it's a white chocolate egg filled with salted caramel ganache and banana ganache. So for those of you in the kingdom, there's quite a few. He's got a few under this range and they look completely like little eggs there. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, everybody. I hope you have a very mellow time. Lots of love to you. Thank you very much for your company. Thank you very much to those of you who have sent me tips in the tip jar. And I look forward to speaking to you on the next broadcast. Stay fruity, stay royal, and stay incredibly sexy. Ta-ra!